Welcome to the Mid-Atlantic Championship Podcast, the podcast that travels back into time to review classic episodes of Jim Crockett Promotions' Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling as it appears on the NBC Universal streaming service Peacock, as well as internationally on the WWE Network. Before we begin today's voyage, I'd just like to note we have social media on several platforms. Our Twitter is the most active, but we have a Facebook page and more. Just search at Mid-Atlantic Pod and look for the logo. And if you want to follow along with us but don't have access to Peacock or the network, you can still do so by heading over to the mighty midatlanticgateway.com and checking out David Taub's reviews of these classic shows. We'd also appreciate you heading over to youtube.com slash midatlanticpod where you can find full podcasts, truncated versions of classic episodes, plus special audio and video clips exclusive to our page and often with the great assistance of the mighty Mid-Atlantic Gateway website. Go to youtube.com slash midatlanticpod and please subscribe, watch, and like the videos. It would be doing us a great service. Now with all that out of the way, today in episode 43, we take a look at the television that was taped on Wednesday, November 17th, 1982 at the WPCQ Studios Channel 36 in Charlotte, North Carolina and began airing in local markets beginning that weekend of Saturday, November 20th. And I bring in my co-host right now, Roman Gomez. Roman, we have a very special edition of this show as a lot of it is going to center around a house show that took place on November 12th in Charlotte. Yes, lots of good action. You know, it's not the uh, squash uh, filled show or anything like that. Lots of good action, lots of good clips. There's some excitement going on in this episode. Absolutely. And uh, the action begins once again, joined in progress, which has become a regular feature of the television show in the last few weeks. It's our first look at Cowboy Bob Orton Jr., who is in the ring against Ben Alexander. Orton is another in the long line of familiar Florida faces being cycled in. He was very successful in the state over the years, teaming with his father, teaming with Dick Slater on his own as a singles competitor. Orton was working in the WWF, where his reputation amongst fans began to swell due to being more prominently featured in the magazines, which were mostly based out of the Northeast. He faced Bob Backlund and Pedro Morales for the WWF and Intercontinental titles in every major city before leaving the territory and embarking on a New Japan tour where he went undefeated in all of his singles matches, only being on the losing end of four- and six-man tag team matches, all of which were opposite a team led by Antonio Inoki. So fresh off of all of that, Orton was coming into the area with a big-time reputation. He's in the ring against Alexander, and Tommy Young's our referee for the day. As is usually the case with these show openers, we see about 30 seconds of it. Orton delivered an atomic drop, held on, and then used a belly-to-back with a bridge to get the pinfall victory. So uh, that was that, Roman, as we uh, have another in a line of 30-second hot openers to begin the show. Yeah, and it definitely put the shine on Orton when Piper said that Orton had taken Backlund to a one-hour draw. You know, they didn't show a lot of the Orton match. You know, it was a very short match and everything, but that little segment right there where Piper said that he took Backlund, the world heavyweight champion, to a one-hour draw, you know, really helps put a shine on Bob Orton Jr., Yeah, and you mentioned uh, Roddy Piper being on commentary. He joins Bob for the entire hour, and after his match, Orton stopped by momentarily and revealed exactly what he was doing in the Carolinas. Roddy Piper called me. He interrupted a beautiful vacation. I was having him, but I don't mind, because the house of Humberdink has got to fall. Roddy Piper and myself. Pleasure to be here. We're talking about fighting fire with fire. We're talking about bringing guys in now that that, that know exactly what they're doing. They got Joel LaDuke. They got House of Humberdink. That's one in Singapore. We saw one of those, didn't we? Yeah, Yeah, House of Humberdink. We got all kinds of stuff. And what you're looking for, if you want to fight fire with fire, you got to look for guys like this gentleman right here, and he just proved himself. All right, fans, and we'll be back. We'll have more. And there we hear Bob Orton and Roddy Piper, a short one from them, announcing what Orton is doing in the area, and that's helping out Piper, Jimmy Valiant, Abdul the Butcher, and anybody else that wants to take the fight to the house of Humperdinck. So uh, Roman uh, Orton now into the area with with Roddy Piper, both as baby faces, obviously more legendarily, they will get together in the WWF and uh, join forces there as a, a great duo inside of Piper's Pit. But here they are as, as baby faces, and it, it just seems like sometimes in Mid-Atlantic, 
at this time, uh, you know, everything is uh, completely opposite of uh, what we usually think in the wrestling world. Yeah, you took the words right, right out of my mouth. I'm so used to seeing Orton and Piper as heels, like you said, in the WWF. So to see them together as baby faces in Mid-Atlantic is definitely going to take a little getting used to. Back from break, Ricky Steamboat has joined Bob, and the two begin to watch from videotape from Friday, November 12th. Five days prior to this television taping, the Charlotte Coliseum, Steamboat and Jay Youngblood against Sergeant Slaughter and Don Carnoodle. This became one of the most important pieces of the puzzle on the way to Greensboro in the March of 1983. We're going to start eavesdropping here about four minutes into the interview. The match is coming to a close, and we'll hear what happens that causes so much heat and helped add to the lore of this feud. The attack right now, lifting him just straight up, high in the air, Rick, right down, right down on his face and, and on his chest goes Slaughter, and that man weighs over 300 pounds, so that's a lot of weight coming down right there, Rick. You know, here's that famous slingshot that we use, one, two, three. Three. Young brother and myself have heard that three thump, that three count from the referee. We have thought that we had won the belts right then and there. Wait a minute. What, what, is the re- what is the referee saying right here? What's He's he doing? He's saying that Slaughter had his foot on the rope. He couldn't stop his hand on that third count, and he didn't see it until afterwards. Ooh, and from behind, you get hit by Canoodle, and down goes the referee. I run right into the referee. Canoodle hits me from behind. And as Jason right there sees what's going on, he's got to get something with Slaughter. He's got to get on that man. The referee is trying to signal, I guess, at the time to continue the match. But as you can see, he's still down. Jason's trying to fight back. Slaughter's got him around the legs. Now here comes Canoodle. Hits Jason from behind. Double teaming right then and there. You two guys really let your guard down then when you heard that that third smack on the mat, didn't you, Rick? Well, we, we expected to have the belts around yeah. our waist right then. And just a, a moment of glitter right there. All right, and here is... Youngblood, as he's double teamed, coming off the ropes, goes yeah. down from that double chop and slaughter now. And Carnotal both standing right over. Referee Tommy Young still dazed, just sitting over in that corner. Looks like he's just not able to get to his feet at this point. And here is Youngblood, just held high to the air there by Carnotal and off Boom. with it. Oh. You know, before all this took place, Carnotal ran outside and posted me to get rid of me. And he did that just then, he did that just to hurt. Jay Youngblood, they had a particular hold and move oh, right, right here. Now, is you a cobra. See Sarge came off the top with that right, clothesline right, on Youngblood's neck, and you can see that he's got the cobra hold on him right then and there, and he's trying to hurt his neck even more. Crudel gets rid of the referee. Now, right here is where the damage is being done, as you can see. Slaughter's got the cobra on Jason's neck, which is already hurt. Crudel's grabbing him by the legs there. Now, they're censoring this part right here now because of the fact of what mm. they had done. To Jay Youngblood is not to be shown, but what I can say is that here it is after the match is over. I couldn't believe it. Youngblood's neck muscles have been ripped out. We don't know exactly how long he's going to be out, but for the last time I talked to him, maybe four weeks, maybe mm. five weeks, at least they know it's over a month. Right now I'm very concerned. I'm trying to get him in the back. I want him to be looked after. He's unconscious right near now. I don't know if anybody that was there that particular night could have seen Youngblood's face, but he was foaming through the mouth. He was even bleeding through the mouth, and I'm just trying to get him back into the locker room. And what I did is I took him straight back to the locker room, and then I took him straight to an emergency clinic. And the next day he flew down to Texas to have his neck looked at at a specialist down there in Texas. Now, like I said, nobody knows exactly how long it's going to take. I don't know. Youngblood doesn't know. If you were in a car accident with a neck problem, I guess a doctor would say that you, you're looking okay. But in professional wrestling with a neck problem, you're not That's really right. sure how long it's going to take. But Youngblood has told me this, that if he's able to come back and wrestle, we're going to tag out once more. We're going to sign those contracts. We're going after those belts. Youngblood told me he's at least going to go down fighting. All right, fans, that's the story right here from Rick Steamboat. And we'll be back. We'll have- and as Bob says, there you hear the story from Ricky Steamboat, what went down at the Charlotte Coliseum, the injury suffered by Jay Youngblood that we couldn't see. They were censored. It was too diabolical to be shown on television. In reality, what it was, it was Sergeant Slaughter holding Jay Youngblood in the Cobra Clutch as Don Cronoodle lifted Youngblood's legs up, putting even more pressure onto his neck as they dropped him down to the mat. In the next upcoming weeks, they will actually show that footage, but they really wanted to ramp up the intensity 
of this feud, the rivalry between the two teams, as well as give Jay Youngblood a reason to not be on TV because Youngblood, along with Steamboat and Mid-Atlantic Booker Dory Funk Jr. would all be heading over to All Japan Pro Wrestling for about three weeks to compete in the Real World Tag League. And as that goes on, we will give you some of the matches that Steamboat and Youngblood are wrestling in, including singles matches like Jay Youngblood against Mitsuharu Misawa. Not bad stuff there, Roman, but they did. I mean, this was just classic pro wrestling. This was uh, an amazing, you know, one, for this length of time to be spent on interviews, and we get a lot of interviews on this show with a lot of guys talking about tape from things that took place in Charlotte. But, you know, this interview, we heard about, what, three and a half, four minutes of it there. It went on for another four minutes or so at the the very beginning with Ricky Steamboat talking about everything that took place during that match there. So a, a very unique moment, you know, to really drive the gravity uh, or really drive the point home and bring gravity to the situation here about Youngblood being so badly injured at the hands of, of Kernoodle in, in Slaughter. Wrestling is an illusion. And to me, wrestling is at its best when things are done that make sense. And there were so many things in this clip that really helped move forward the angle. You know, I thought it was great that they actually showed Steamboat and Youngblood getting a pinfall on Slaughter and Carnoodle. Not just for the fans at the arena, but that they showed it on TV. So now the whole area can see that Steamboat and Youngblood can, in fact, beat Slaughter and Carnoodle. So I thought that was good. The censoring of what was going on. As a fan, it's frustrating. You know, we want to know what happened. But, you know, and you look at it, it's actually kind of brilliant. Like, man, what Slaughter and Carnoodle did was so devastating, was so such a heel-type thing, they couldn't show it on TV. It makes you wonder what was going on. And then Steamboat to say that Youngblood had to go to a neck specialist. And it just, they really did a good job in telling the story there. And it makes people crave to see young blood come back because you know the fire is going to be turned up a little bit more absolutely and they kept reality into it you know with steamboat talking about the fact that look you know he's not for a mortal hey he, he, he could come back and be fine but he's an athlete this is pro wrestling you know you do a lot of damage to your neck my heavens look at what's happened with mike rotundo over these last couple of weeks with leroy brown you know and for for that to happen tenfold at the hands of Slaughter and Kernoodle to Jay Youngblood, you know, you know, is his career, you know, is it ever going to be the same? But you know what? He's going to come back fighting like a good baby face does, and you're going to see him again, says Ricky Steamboat. And of course, we do see everybody again, but before we see everybody again, we go to break, and when we come back, we see Roddy Piper again. He's in the ring against Private Jim Nelson, and... uh Roman uh, Piper starts this thing off like he usually does a house of fire and feels like we're going to have a shoot, uh, just a, a really super short Piper match again. But Nelson actually cut Piper off and got in a moment of offense before that abruptly ended. Piper busted out the big double arm ear clap and stomps and all that sort of stuff before pinning Nelson after using a gut wrench suplex when a little over two minutes. A gut wrench suplex finisher from Roddy Piper. Don't know if I've ever seen that before. And it seemed to come out of nowhere. You know, there was back and forth action and what little we did see. And the gut wrench suplex just seemed to come out of nowhere for the pinfall. It's a, it's a sign to Private Nelson that, hey, you, you are much higher on the food chain than Keith Larson. But uh, we only got so much time to fill here. So after you get a couple of shots and Piper's going to beat you and that's going to be that. We then went and got footage of number one Paul Jones against Jack Briscoe, also from November 12th in Charlotte, as their feud for the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship rages on. Briscoe joined Bob at the desk and will join the interview in progress as the match comes to a close. There's no referee there. I kick out, and you see Paul deliberately goes and jumps over the top rope, trying to get uh, himself, myself the cue, deliberately jumped over the rope. Hoping that the referee was going to disqualify you for swinging him over the ropes. Unfortunately, huh? Fargo. Is what, now he's telling the referee that this the referee is what referee Fargo, as, as he went on the floor, he looked up and he saw what happened. He saw Paul Jones trying to jump over the top rope to get me these cues. 
right here, Bob. I just had to admit I kind of lost my cool. I'm just uh, throwing off the rule book out the window. And then all I'm thinking about it's now just is trying, right trying now. to get even with Paul Jones. Trying to engine, trying to hurt him, make him feel like he, I felt when I was on crutches for that week. All right, he's down again on the mat. And Jack looks like here you this morning and we get up so you can land some more lefts yeah, and right. Just, I just want to give him all the punch and I can. He gets me right there on the side of the head with the karate. Through the karate, I saw it coming and was able to turn. I'll go for the figure four right, leg figure lock four, now. And you've got a figure four locked in, looks like, Jack. I certainly do. And like I said, right now, I'm thinking about the time he defeated me right here with a karate. He just threw the karate, just tried to get me disqualified. I've got the figure four leg lock on him. And I know that he's a defeated man now, and I'm wanting to hurt his leg. Because he had me on crutches for 10 days. And believe me, I think about it. Every time I see Paul Jones, I think about walking around on crutches for all those All right, days. and Paul is finding it, Jack. He made the ropes right yeah, here. He's he gets in the ropes, and I see, I see he's in the ropes, but I don't care at this point. It doesn't make any difference. I just I want to you, hurt his gonna, leg. I want to weaken that leg. Uh, see, the referee, referee's trying to break yeah, me up here, and I just refuse right. to break. He, what does he do? He says ring the bell. And he's disqualified you at this point, yeah, Jack. Is that right? Yes, he's disqualified me right here. I don't care. I still want a piece of that Paul Jones leg. Well, we're still trying to break <laughs> you, us up you're there. You're just refusing to give it up, Jack. Well, I know it's all over now for Paul Jones, and I'm trying to finish him off with that leg. He got the leg, leg hyperextended, and he's in a lot of pain. And, uh, and believe me, I, that's what I tell you. I go through with Paul Jones. And you're continuing now to work and stomp at the leg, even after, even after you get him out of that, that uh, death lock. Like I said, I just threw the rule book out the window. I wanted to hurt Paul Jones, and that's exactly what I went out and intended to do. All right, Jack, but certainly now that belt is still uppermost in your mind, Well, right? certainly is. I know that I've weakened Paul Jones' knee now. I know that he's not at full strength, and I'm sure the next time I get him in the ring, I'm going to be the new Mid-Atlantic champion. All right, fans, and there you have it, right here at ringside, and you saw it with Jack Briscoe. And we heard it from Jack Briscoe talking to Bob about what went down in Charlotte? He and number one Paul Jones battling over the Mid Atlantic Heavyweight Championship. Roman saw some good action there between the two. As one would expect, these guys have been wrestling each other at this point now well over a decade. Paul Jones was a uh, top man in Florida for a long time in the early 70s. And of course, Jack Briscoe, former NWA World Heavyweight Champion, just a classic. Great to hear him do an interview and actually get some time in here, Roman, as everybody did on this show, as uh, these interview segments really, they gave these guys a lot of time to tell the story of what took place in Charlotte. Yeah, and I thought it was funny when Paul Jones went over the top rope. When I initially watched that, I go, come on, this just looks so ridiculous. But then when Jones went up to the ref and like, he threw me over the top rope, disqualify him. I was like, what a great chicken bleep heel type move to do, you know, to throw yourself over the top rope and then complain to the ref and say that the other wrestler threw you over the top rope. So I thought that was kind of cool. And Briscoe having so much hatred and animosity towards Paul Jones that not only did he get disqualified for keeping the figure four on so long, he kept it on after the bell and didn't care. He, he wanted to hurt Paul Jones and extract a little revenge and if the role was reversed and a heel kept the figure four on after the bell, we would have heard about fines and suspensions, but because the baby face did it, it was considered justice. It was just one of those things in wrestling, the you know, the nuances of wrestling, I guess I should say. Yeah, when it's overdone, it's a cheap thing, but when it's done properly and there's heat going on and the people are all crazed and the, the baby face is crazed and he just can't control himself and championship he's going after be damned he's going to get some revenge and get his pound of flesh on somebody in the in the way that jack briscoe wanted to on paul jones that result gets forgotten about and people just want to see the rematch again they want to see that baby face get his revenge as jack briscoe goes after paul jones and we then gotten in lieu of segment usually there's no localized promo to be found we fill time and get practice promos from the younger talent, but occasionally we'd get something more market specific. Like in this case, after speaking over the VTR about Jones, Jack Briscoe sticks around. And I can tell you this, he does a much better job with this two minutes and 28 seconds than Keith Larson or Steve Seibert or any of those guys like that. Briscoe says hello to Florida, talks about his younger brother Jerry, 
and uh, talks about he and Jerry getting involved in the tag title mix against Slaughter and Kernoodle. Jack, always a pleasure to have you, and the fans always enjoy watching you in that ring whenever you're on, on television. Well, thank you, Bob. It's certainly nice to be in this area, and I understand that the tape is, uh, the show is also being shown down in Florida That's now, right. where I live for many years. I'd just like to say hello to all the folks down in Florida. I know there's a lot of action going on down there with Dusty Rhodes and, and the group. I'd like to say hello to Dusty and a lot of the people down there. All right, and uh, as you say, a lot of action down there, a lot of action everywhere. What about the action for Jack Briscoe? Well, the action for me is, of course, trying to get Paul Jones. To Paul Jones defeated me right here on this television for the Mid-Atlantic Championship. I've been trying to get back at him and trying to win that championship back. Also, you know, Jerry is going to come into this area and join up with me here, and I'm, I'm real happy about Jerry coming in. And, uh, of course, you know the world's tag well, team right. champions, uh, Slaughter and Canoodle right here in uh, – and you just seen a while ago what they did to Jay Youngblood. And Jay Youngblood's a friend of mine. He's a friend of Jerry's. And I know how bad uh, Steamboat's feeling right now, losing a close friend and his tag team partner like Jay. But uh, believe me, uh, Jerry and I want to get even with these guys. We want to help Steamboat out in any way we can. And we'd certainly like to get a match with these guys for the world. Yeah, Jack, it looks like now Slaughter and, uh, and his partner Kanoda looks like even now that they want to go hurt somebody. They want to put them out. They want to get rid. That's the way they're going to get rid of the opponents. Well, bit. it was obvious in that match that Steamboat and Youngblood had them defeated and was on the way to becoming world champions. Just like Steamboat said earlier, I thought they'd won the belts too, but Slaughter had his leg just barely over that rope and they didn't. So, uh, you know, uh, Slaughter and Canoodle then just, uh, of course, went, just like you said, went in and deliberately hurt Youngblood. All right, Jack, you've been to the top. You've been a world champ. Uh, and it, there's always something extra special about being champion. And that's something I think that all athletes strive for, right? Well, it certainly is true. And the goal of every wrestler in professional wrestling today is, of course, of, to attain the world's heavyweight championship, whether it be in tag team or in singles. And of course, Ric Flair... Uh, is doing a great job as world's champion. You know, I don't agree in, in uh, the other ways he does or the, or the tactics he uses, but the man has done a tremendous job. He's uh, he's uh, wrestling all the time. He's wrestling the, the top men all over the country, all over the world at all times, and he's uh, he's a man that uh, is going to have to take another man to defeat him, and he's been a real great champion, but I'd sure like to get a chance at him. And fans, that's it right here, ringside with Jack Briscoe. So there we get a little bit of bonus, Jack Briscoe, the former NWA heavyweight champion, Roman. You know, that's how you do one of those things, you know, for those guys watching backstage, uh, Larson's, your cyberts. I, I pointed those two guys out. They're gone right now. I guess I could substitute guys like Ken Timms, former Marine Gary Black, who we saw on last week's episode, guys like that. That's how you do that there. Jack Briscoe never raised his voice. Just kept an a, a even steady keel. And, you know, for a guy like Briscoe, Bob Cottle and Gordon Soley, who are the two main announcers that he's always going to be associated with, I mean, perfect matches for the type of speaker that he was. Yeah, they can definitely lead people through an interview, which is so important, you know, for the announcer to be a conduit to the fans and to lead things the way it needs to go and, and to understand like, well, this wrestler's struggling. Maybe I should ask him another question or, you know, Cottle and Sully were just so great at what they did. We then went to break. And when we came back, the new United States heavyweight champion, Greg, the hammer Valentine is alongside Bob to re also review some footage. Last week, we saw the close of Valentine's match against Wahoo McDaniel in Norfolk, Virginia on November 4th. With Wahoo's comments, here we see a little bit more of the film and we get to hear Valentine's thoughts on whether or not he used a foreign object to KO the Chief. We'll pick up the hammer, joined in progress. Dance. That in, fact, Hulk chop. in fact, maybe really they can get him really. a job as a wooden Indian or something, huh? Now here he goes, he's going to take me out. This is the kind of wrestler Wahoo McDaniel is, always cheating. He's going to ram my head into that iron pulse. Well, what do you got to say about that, Bob Connell? You call that fair, huh? You call that fair? That's the Indian in him. That's the savage. That's the no good rotten person I'm talking about. That's why he has kept the belt for so long. Because he does that to all his opponents. He brings in steel chairs. He runs them in the iron post. He brings brass knucks in the ring. He does anything that he can do to win. There he is again. Give you another chop. Another one of those That's right. Well, I'm dazed. And I'm bleeding also because the man, like I said, he just ran me into the iron post. There goes another hard chop. Now I got to admit, Walt McDaniel's got the upper hand here. Ooh, right across the mouth. But as you can see right there, 
I put my foot on the rope. I saved myself. You understand? That's how smart I am. Now Mr. Humperdinck's coming over. He's going to give me some encouragement. This is the picture in question. Now they said that, that Mr. Humperdinck handed me Maybe something. Sure. That is false. All he did was come over and say, you're doing a good job, Greg. Get up there and beat that in and get that U.S. title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go again. He's illegally he reaching like, over. It looks like you're holding something. No, I'm not holding anything. He's illegally reaching over the rope. He shouldn't be doing this. He should be letting me getting into the ring. Now he's illegally suplexing me from the outside. But watch the hammer. The hammer right there. Now watch this, Bob Cottle. It's a proof of the pudding. One, two, three. The new champion, Greg Valentine. There we hear from the hammer, Greg Valentine, speaking over the film from Norfolk where he defeated Wahoo McDaniel to win the United States Heavyweight Championship. Certainly looked like he was uh, pulling something out of his trunks there and was was given an object which he knocked Wahoo out with as Wahoo gave him a back suplex back into the ring, down to the mat. McDaniel unconscious. Valentine once again defeating McDaniel for a title. Uh, most famously, about four years earlier, putting the uh, European leg lock on McDaniel to take the Mid-Atlantic Championship this time around. Takes the United States Heavyweight Championship like he said he was going to do as this Valentine-McDaniel feud rolls on here. What do you think about the hammer here? Is You know, that, that was, you know, Valentine, a solid promo. You could see where, you know, just a lot like Paul Orndorff, he was almost, the, the promo was, was so real that that's the thing that held him back. You know, there were no theatrics to, to Greg Valentine. He was fired up, he, he, he was, but he was very real about his promos. This wasn't as eloquent as Ric Flair or The Rock or anybody like that, but very believable. Yes, and the lies of a great heel. Yes. No, I didn't use a foreign object. He came up to give me encouragement and tell me, keep going, Greg, you're doing great. <laughs> just, just great stuff. And then to hit him with the foreign object and get the victory, it just, Simple, old-school wrestling for the heel to get over. Now, at the end of the show last week, I mentioned that the WWE Network preview, which mentioned that Mike Rotundo was going to be facing off against Leroy Brown, was kind of burying the lead. Because when you look at the results of this show, one match really kind of sticks out. And, you know, after the break, we go right into the introductions for that match. It's Dory Funk Jr.'s $100,000 challenge match, where if his opponent can defeat him in less than 10 minutes, they win his money. His opponent today? Jack Briscoe! <laughs> Sorry, I yelled that. Jack Briscoe, fellow former NWA World Heavyweight Champion. He's going to be the one facing off against Dory Funk Jr. This was not mentioned. At the beginning of the show, Jack Briscoe. Now, you heard him cut two promos. The second promo that you heard, nobody heard, okay? That was just people in Florida may have heard that because they weren't getting local promos. But other than that, that would have been lost the time if it wasn't for the network. But the initial promo uh, where he talked about over the footage with Paul Jones, there, he, during that show, during that part of the show, he never mentions He's got a match coming up against Dory Funk Jr. for $100,000 on TV. And even while the match is going on, frankly, you know, th there's not a whole lot of excitement from Bob Cottle during it. He's worried about some other things. But, Roman, before we get to that, I mean, <laughs> Dory Funk Jr. against Jack Briscoe on Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling for free. I was going to watch the episode no matter what, but it had they announced at the beginning Dory Funk versus Jack Briscoe in our main event, to, that would have grabbed me right from the get-go. And that should have been brought up. And it was a good match, like you would expect, two former world champions. And like you said, Bob Cottle was talking about Piper and Abdullah teaming and the young blood injury and Valentine's title win and I don't know why they did not want to give this match the attention that it deserved. The only thing I can think of is because of the way the match went and because of, of what it was, that they didn't want to raise expectations. That's the only thing I, I can think of here. And during the match, 
as Roman mentioned, you know, Bob was talking about names we were going to see in the area. I mean, there wasn't like there was anything palpable coming from Bob about the gravity of this match or the importance of this match between the two men. It was it was treated. It, it felt like it was just another match as. He talked about the Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair, who had already appeared on house shows. They were coming back to the area. Bruiser Brody, who was mentioned last week. And two names were added to the list, which, again, incredibly impressive. Harley Race and Terry Funk now also will be on their way to Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. The only other NWA World Heavyweight Champions, former champions out there, with the exception of Tommy Rich, who we saw earlier in the year in the mid-Atlantic area. So a embarrassment of riches for the Cadillac of wrestling territories. And and this match was all about Briscoe being one step ahead of Funk the entire time. Funk bailed to the floor twice. Every time he tried to get rough, Briscoe would return the favor. And finally, Funk has enough, and he throws Briscoe over the top rope to the floor. Referee Tommy Young calls for the bell, and in exactly, I mean, because... It's it's Jack Briscoe and Dory Funk Jr. in exactly five minutes flat. Briscoe wins the match by disqualification, Roman. Briscoe and, and Funk kind of go back, you know, at each other a little bit after the match before Funk bails for good and escapes out the back studio door there. Again, just because it only went five minutes, that's the only thing I can think of as to why they didn't make a big deal out of this match. Yeah, you you weren't expecting a one-hour Broadway on TV or anything, but these two legends, these two former world heavyweight champions, to get five minutes, and it it was disappointing in the fact that it was short. That was one of my complaints about this match. It was a good match, but five minutes for these two legends? You know, and at one point in the match, Briscoe even reversed the Indian deathlock, or I'm sorry, the spinning toehold that Dory put on. I mean, that's not something you see every day, you know, and they could have made a lot bigger deal of this. And that, you know, I had two complaints about this match and one was the length of time. And then two Cottle spent probably 20% of the match talking about other stuff. Hey, look, you're just going to have to buy your ticket to go to Greensboro. Okay. You know, we're only going (laughs) to whet your appetite here a little bit. Sorry, brother. You got to, you got to get in the vehicle. You got to go pay the money at the box office. Although really, you know, the real rib here is the fact that Jack Briscoe would be challenging Dory Funk Jr. in a match for $100,000 where he has to beat him in under 10 minutes because have these two ever had a match that didn't go at least 30? (laughs) You know what I mean? So, (laughs) but, like, you know, again, like Roman mentioned, I mean, you can't have those two guys and not want more. So, but it was a tease for the house shows, and the show went to break, and when we came back, we have more VTRs from Charlotte. This time around, it's Sir Oliver Humperdinck and Leroy Brown alongside Bob to watch footage of Brown against Dusty Rhodes. We'll pick it up in progress and hear that this battle is about to be taken to another level in the form of a bull rope. Dusty Rhodes in a familiar position. I've seen Dusty Rhodes on his knees begging for mercy before. I'm in that position again where I see him down begging for mercy from bad, bad Leroy Brown right now. Dusty Rhodes, they're all coming. Bob Orton Jr., I heard Bob Orton Jr. out here saying how he's going to collapse the house of Humperdinck and build his own mansion. Well, you're going to have to get by guys like Leroy Brown, Joe LaDuke, Greg Valentine, the U.S. champ, and, of course, Paul Jones of Mid-Atlantic. I wanted to ask you a question, too. What is a bull rope match, Humperdinck? Well, you got me. I don't know what it is. This is uh, stipulations that Dusty Rhodes has. Dusty Rhodes can't win a wrestling match, so he has to throw in all sorts of stupid stipulations like Texas bull rope matches, this and that, bunkhouse matches. Now take a look at the man's style. When I'm talking about style, I'm talking about sportsmanship, which is very important to everybody at the House of Humperdinck. Look at Dusty Rhodes here. Look at Dusty Rhodes. Unsportsmanlike conduct, I call it. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Of course, the people like it because they're behind this man. They're behind him. They know what he's here for. He's here to destroy us. But he's not going to do it. You know, let me tell you something. I'm the man that whooped that big Dusty Rose in Florida. And I'm the man that'll do it right here in Carolina. Let me tell you, a bull rope. I now know the bull rope match is the one thing. I used to work in the slaughterhouse back in Chicago. And one thing I learned back in the slaughterhouse is that that's to take care of big pig like Dusty Rhodes. Hey, he's biting on Yeah, now there's, there's your American yeah. dream. There's your former world's heavyweight champion. 
biting, actually resorting to biting, and they call Leroy and I dirty wrestlers. Let me let me redefine that word. Dirty wrestlers is Dusty Rhodes. There, Dusty Rhodes, how does it feel? Excedrin headache number six, brother, and he's not through yet. Take a look at this, outside the ring, peppering him with punches, splitting that big old head open just like a watermelon. Dusty Rhodes, you picked the wrong man to invade this area with bad, bad Leroy Brown. Leroy did it to you once before, he'll do it to you again, brother, anytime you want. Watch this. Well, he ducked right under that. Looked like Leroy was going to close line and take his head off. High to the air. Not Ooh, the three count. Not the three count. Yeah. No, sir. It was one, two. Leroy regained his, his consciousness. Kicked out at the two count. Dusty Rhodes again firing fists now. now. Take a look. Closed fist. Now tell me that's an open hand. And the coup de grace. Double fist to the forehead of Leroy Brown. Now any normal man would have stayed down. But Leroy is coming back to his feet. He's not through with this big, preposterous, I call him a paraplegic sheepdog. That's what he looks like. All right, here's Leroy right through the rope. Now here's Dusty coming outside after Leroy. I don't think there's a ring big enough to hold these two. Now there's your, there's your sportsman, Dusty Rhodes, throwing chairs all over, throwing my man Leroy into a table, banging his head into a wood table. Leroy, being a sportsman that he is, wants to take the action back into the ring where it belongs, not out on the floor like Dusty Rhodes likes to do it. Now look at this, flagrantly, flagrantly pulling his tights. That elbow. bionic elbow, that's a bionic elbow. Dusty Rhodes hasn't seen a bionic elbow. Now Leroy, it's come to this, it's come to Dusty Rhodes invading our home turf. It's come to Dusty Rhodes and Leroy Brown. And there you heard from Sir Oliver Humperdinck and Leroy Brown talking about Dusty Rhodes and their match in Charlotte. It was then time for our second in lieu of promo. Humperdinck and Brown stayed out there and cut a promo on Mike Rotundo about their match coming up next. Solid promo from Brown, but nothing that stood out. The same went for Mike Rotundo when they came back from break. He had about 10 seconds before he jumped in the ring to start the match with Big Leroy. As he came through the ropes, Brown attacked him and we were off to the races. Unsurprisingly, Brown's offense focused on going after Rotundo's injured neck, and it should be noted that Rotundo was not wearing any variation of his neck brace in the match, not the football-styled one, not a full-style neck brace, none of that stuff. But the match built towards the spot where Brown picked Rotundo up to deliver the pile driver and more trauma to Rotundo's neck, but Rotundo was able to reverse it, backdropping Brown and going on the offense. Didn't last all that long, though. Humperdinck distracted the ref. Rotundo lost focus. That allowed Brown to punch him in the back of the head, knocking him down long enough to deliver the big elbow and get the victory. Went about six and a half minutes. Popped the crowd. And then it was time for our show-closing promos. Sir Oliver came over to the desk, as did Paul Jones and Joe LaDuke. But first, we hear from the reigning World Tag Team Champions, Sergeant Slaughter and Don Carnoodle. They tore up little Tommy Peterson signed two weeks ago. And now they've torn up Jay Youngblood's neck. And here's where we'll hear Carnoodle utter the classic line, No more lays and no more Jay. Here they are, fans, the world tag team champions, Don Carnoodle, Sergeant Slaughter. That's exactly right. No more pitches of uncrowned champions. No more headdresses. No more lays and no more Jay. Tell them about it, Sarge. They took the respirator <laughs> off today on Jay. You know... Jay Youngblood, I had a flower for you. I took this flower. I was going to give it to you, but it's kind of like you now, Jay Youngblood. There's no more smell, and it's kind of wilting, and it's kind of dying out. We did just like we said we were going to do. We made an example of you, Jay Youngblood. Ricky Steamboat, I warned you not to mess with me. You can spin the wind. You can take the mask off the old Long Ranger. But you don't mess around with Don Cronodo and Sergeant Slaughter. There's nobody that wants to wrestle us now. No competition. We have no more competition. We got rid of Young Blood and Steamboat. We got rid of a thorn in our side. I can't blame anybody for not wanting to wrestle us because we worked many, many hours on the Slaughter Cannon off the top rope and you saw just what it did. And you know, I don't want Mr. Canolo to get cocky now. 
But we have a matchup against Abdullah the Butcher and Roddy Piper. And Roddy Piper, you just better not play any law playing albums either. All right, Sir Oliver Hubbard Inc. right here. World Tag Team Champions yeah. indeed, but I have my own champions, and one of which was right here, Mr. Paul oh, Jones, a Mid Atlantic Heavyweight Champion, Jack Briscoe. Jack Briscoe. Jack Briscoe. Let me tell you something. Hubbard Inc. and I had a conference, and he told me I've got to finish off Briscoe. For a simple reason, Briscoe is getting a little smarter than we gave him credit for. He's going around getting matches like no disqualification. That means he can do anything he wants to win this belt, so he's getting him further towards this belt. With Briscoe, I'm going to end your career once and for all. That's exactly right. And a man who once held a title but was stripped of it by the NWA, and namely Sandy Scott, for assaulting him, Mr. Joe LaDuke. He is not no longer the TV champion. That's true. But let me tell you one thing, Jimmy Valiant, everywhere you look, that's going to be behind you, brother. So keep one good eye over that shoulder because we're right behind you. And there we hear the show come to an end with the words of Sir Oliver Humperdinck, Joe LaDuke, stripped of the Mid-Atlantic Television Champion, as you heard, for putting hands on Sandy Scott and the battles that he was having with the boogie-woogie man Jimmy Valiant. Locally, if you were watching this show in Greensboro, you would know that coming up on Thanksgiving night, they would be filling that position via 20-man over-the-top rope battle royal where the last two men would face off against each other. But LeDuc's battles with Jimmy Valiant, TV title or not, uh, would not be ending. But we had heard from Sergeant Slaughter and Don Cornoodle at the very beginning there, Roman, and a great line from Don Cornoodle. Uh, for those who have a chance to see the episode, a classic poop-eating grin on Sergeant Slaughter's face, which is so, <laughs> so macabre, because it's when he's talking about, they took Jay off the respirator today. He says that, and he's just got this, his mouth hanging open, look on his face of just joy, which is just extra. It just pisses you off even more as a wrestling fan and as a little kid watching him just take so much glee and putting Jay Youngblood out of commission, but a classic promo for those two to kick everything off. They were quite proud of their accomplishments, you know, and uh, like you said, Slaughter with that grin and, and thank goodness there was no internet back in the 80s because that angle would have never worked. People would have been like, you didn't really injure him. He's in Japan, you know. So it was great the time, you know, that was going on in the 80s with the fact that you could do angles like that. And uh, no more Lays, no more Jay. Roman, now that we reached the end of this thing, is there is there anything that we didn't touch on that stood out to you that uh, you want to talk about? Uh, well, we've touched on everything, but I, I enjoyed this episode, even though it was very highlight-driven. And, you know, with the young blood injury, I thought that was cool that they censored that to add a little more deviousness, if you will, to the heels, that what they did was so bad it had to be censored. I enjoyed the Dory Funk Briscoe. Not every day you're going to see two world champions on TV for free. And then the... Mike Rotundo winning the crowd over that, that impressed me, you know, was not expecting to see that, but that fired up promo last week actually won people over there behind Mike Rotundo. So I, I thought that was nice to see in this episode as well. We don't have results from sister program worldwide wrestling this week. So we'll get right to the results from around the circuit. As we close in on the last Thanksgiving before the Starcade era begins next year in 1983. Let's take time for this commercial message about the Mid-Atlantic Wrestling events coming up in your area. We start Thursday night, November 18th, Sumter County Exhibition Center, Sumter, South Carolina. Mike Rotundo subbing for Jay Youngblood, who is selling his throat injury, defeated Paul Jones. Jack Briscoe would pull double duty that night as he would defeat Dory Funk Jr., and also filled in for Wahoo McDaniel, teaming with Sweet Brown Sugar to knock off Sergeant Slaughter and Don Carnoodle. Also on Thursday the 18th, Harrisonburg High School Gym in Harrisonburg, Virginia, Candy Malloy was scheduled to face off against Donna Christianello, and Jimmy Valiant faced off against Joe LaDuke in a cage match. The next night, Friday the 19th, County Hall, Charleston, South Carolina, Greg Valentine was scheduled to face Wahoo McDaniel, and Pork Chop Cash against Gene Anderson. 
Skip ahead to Sunday the 21st, Roanoke Civic Center. Dory Funk Jr. defeated Mike Rotundo. Roddy Piper took Jay Youngblood's place and teamed with his former rival Ricky Steamboat, and the pair defeated Sergeant Slaughter and Don Cronoodle in a boot camp match. U.S. Champion Greg Valentine defeated Wahoo McDaniel, and NWA World Champion Ric Flair defeated Jack Briscoe in a no-disqualification match. On Monday the 22nd in Greenville Memorial Auditorium, Bob Orton Jr., Abdullah the Butcher, and Jimmy Valiant defeated Sir Oliver Humperdinck, Paul Jones, and Joe LaDuke. Roddy Piper defeated Greg Valentine, and NWA World Champion Ric Flair defeated Ricky Steamboat. On Tuesday, November 23rd, Raleigh Civic Center, NWA World Champion Ric Flair defeated Roddy Piper by DQ, and Jack Briscoe, Bob Orton Jr., subbing for Jimmy Valiant, and Abdullah the Butcher defeated Paul Jones, Joe LaDuke, and Leroy Brown. Wednesday, November 24th, Township Auditorium, Columbia, South Carolina. Columbia was usually a Tuesday night venue every single week, but with Thanksgiving happening the next day, everything got shifted around a little bit. The main event would see Jimmy Valiant, Wahoo McDaniel, and Abdul the Butcher face off against Greg Valentine, Leroy Brown, and Sir Oliver Humperdinck inside of a steel cage. Also, Jerry Briscoe was scheduled to face Don Carnoodle and sweep Brown Sugar against Private Nelson. And that takes us to the WPCQ Studios. Charlotte, North Carolina, for another television taping, Mid-Atlantic, and Worldwide Wrestling. And here's the WWE Network preview for next week. And boy, is it a good one. NWA World Heavyweight Champion Ric Flair wants to humiliate Roddy Piper in a unique confrontation. Finally, one of these previews that does the program justice. If you like this show and would like to connect with it more, I invite you to follow us across our many forms of social media, especially on Twitter. Just search at MidAtlanticPod. We would also really appreciate you following us on YouTube, youtube.com backslash MidAtlanticPod, full and truncated podcasts, plus great audio and video clips from the rich history of Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling and Jim Crockett Promotions. That's youtube.com backslash MidAtlanticPod. I also invite you to support all of the programs and content here on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. We don't condescend, and we are dedicated to preserving and accurately archiving the history of professional wrestling. And I'm proud that this show, produced by me, can be a part of that. For Roman Gomez, I'm Mike Sempervivi. Take us home, Bob DeBartolabin and Uncle Bob Cottle. Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling has been furnished to this station for broadcast at this time by Jim Crockett Promotions in exchange for commercial consideration. Fans, next week on Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, Bob Overzill and the Mighty Igor against Charlie Fulton and Tony Russo, Mr. Wrestling will take on Larry Sharp, Paul Jones and Wahoo McDaniel against Kim Duck and Ricky Ferrara, Superstar and the Russian Stomper against Francisco Flores and Steve Kovacs, and Black Jack Mulligan will take on Phil Mercado all next week.